hard. <laughs> okay. And then I uh, will also quickly share my screen with you all. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yep. Okay. Great. Um, so welcome <laughs> to our uh, January global webinar of the global webinar series. Um, so uh, Raina introduced me earlier, but my name's Sonia. Um, I'm the campaigns coordinator intern uh, at MCN. Um, so the next two hours of the uh, here online, we're going to have um, two parts. The first part will be the remote fellowship, and then the second part will be um, led by uh, one of our gender network campaign leaders. Um, hang on. Uh, so, um, hang on. I'm here. Uh, so, the first part of our webinar will be led by uh, Alvina Shaw. Is that how you pronounce, pronounce your name? Okay. It is, yeah. Okay, from YW Boston. And the second part, as I said, will be our campaign. Um, we'll have, oh, so uh, we have uh, this year um, at MCC 16, there were two uh, global campaigns uh, selected, the Gender Network campaign and the uh, Clean Street, Clean Sea uh, Global Oceans campaign. Um, and the two of them are alternating months, uh, taking turns leading the second portion of the webinar. Um, so next month on February 21st, we'll have the two brothers leading the oceans campaign um, online with us uh, so uh, just an administrative note <laughs> I guess I know everyone who's online right now um, but I'll chat this into the chat bar as people join us uh, if you well if you uh, log on to the campaign late and um, view this later uh, if you could chat into the bar your email address uh, where you're calling in from and um, your name, just so we can get uh, keep track of attendance um, and make our webinars better and better. Um, so this is what we have going on today. Um, first, we'll have our remote fellowship led by Alvina Shaw, who is the Director of Programs, Performance, and Evaluation at YW Boston. Um, and then we'll have our two will be part of our Global Gender Forum, which will be led by our Gender Prize winner, Beryl. Um, and so now uh, I'm excited to introduce <laughs> <laughs> Alvina Shaw from YW Boston, who will be, who's the Director of Program Performance and Evaluation. Um, and she'll be speaking about Monitoring and Evaluation 101. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and turn it over to you, Alvina. Thank you so much, Sonia. Um, yeah, so I, I'm... Are you able to share? Yeah, totally. Let's see. Great. I am, first of all, I'm super happy to be here. I love MCN's model, and I am so happy to provide support any way I can to the fellows and, and everyone working within the network. Uh, so thank you very much for hosting me. Um, so when Raina asked me to do an ME 101, I was thinking, what are the very basics of what an, an evaluation um, plan? And I thought that we would throw it up with logic models today. So I'm hoping today that we'll start by discussing what a logic model is exactly. We'll go through one that's super basic. Um, and then I want to share one from my work with YW Boston. We have a program called Youth Police Dialogues that um, I'm super passionate about. And we have quite an interesting logic model for. So everyone who is watching the webinar now or later can follow along with that. So. Introductions, I mean, there's four of us right now and we all know each other, but I'm hoping as, as people pop in, um, they can type into the chat bar that they're here. Um, I'll talk about why WCA Boston's evaluation plan. I'll go through what is the logic model. And then at the very end, I'm hoping there will be time for questions and discussion. And depending on how many people there are at the end, I also want to open up um, a few questions that I'll have on the slide. But otherwise, I'll just make Sonia and Jessica uh, give me all the answers. So, and I already know who's in the room right now. 
but also this comic is just funny. <laughs> so I'm Alvina again, and so I started my work in monitoring and evaluation actually through psychology research. Um, and early in my career doing psych research, I realized that there was a version of the research method that I could apply to people's real lives that could affect real change. And so early in my career, I did public policy analysis. Um, and then I realized that I wanted to go back to uh, direct service as close as possible while still doing some of my, um, using the research skills that I had and making sure that I could be a part of iterating for positive change. And so my first stint in m and &E abroad was actually with an organization called More Than Me. And I was the monitoring and evaluations fellow there. Um, unfortunately, due to the Ebola crisis, I had to leave Liberia and I ended up doing m and &E in Boston. And I learned a lot of cool lessons making that transition as well. And so if anyone has any questions about that, I would be happy to answer them at the end of the call. Oh, and that's my nephew and he's just cute. So again, there's so many pictures that I just include because they amuse me. Um, so YWCA Boston is dedicated to eliminating racism, empowering women, and promoting peace, justice, freedom, and dignity for all. So, you know, any day now, within the next three to six months, we're anticipating completion of our mission. Uh, no. So it's a, it's a big, broad mission, right? And so the mission comes to us from YWCA National. And the beauty of that mission is that every YW uh, within the cities, um, outside of YW National, which is in uh, Washington, D.C., can decide how they want to approach the mission for themselves. Um, and so for us, we approach them primarily through our programs. Um, and so the programs that we run are Lead Boston, which is an adult leadership program uh, where we bring cross-sector pr uh, professionals to work together to learn about some of the problems that Boston is facing and then at the end do an action project. The Youth Leadership Initiative is essentially uh, a model of that program for young adults. We do a women's health and girls health program and we really center those programs around helping women and girls make the best decisions um, that they can for themselves and being empowered to do so. Dialogues on race and ethnicity and then finally the youth police dialogues and so we have a big portfolio of programs and it is it does make my job more complicated to have six programs to evaluate but uh, we'll specifically focus on the Youth Police Dialogues program for later. And so the first thing I would recommend with anyone thinking about uh, creating a project for the first time and creating a theory of change for the first time um, is to really map out exactly what you're hoping to accomplish with the project. And so I'm going to show you, this is the theory of change we have for the entire organization, which is uh, the for the whole umbrella of YWCA Boston. And so what we see is that we have all of these racial disparities, gender disparities and social cohesion issues, and that's kind of key for, for class issues. And all of our programs target education. And so whether it's a women's health program or a girls health program, we're thinking about making sure that we can get people in the room together and build upon their own knowledge and and hopefully they can learn from each other. And if there's anything that we as facilitators can introduce as new knowledge, we'll do so. And so it's primarily through education, although it's not through, you know, schools, it's not through Boston Public, it's not, not always through Boston Public Schools. And so we, we have a slightly larger idea of what education means to us. So our key methods are programs, convenings, meaning events to get people to um, learn who we are for the first time. Uh, and learn about some of our work and then through advocacy methods, which is actually new for today. I mean, excuse me, for this year, not just today. Um, and then we're hoping that enhanced knowledge, improved attitudes and trust, and then immediate behavior change follows that with the ultimate mission of measurable improvements in gender and racial equity. So it is, it seems complicated, but just having the theory of change down on paper helps us to be able to uh, connect our programs and explain our programs in a way that makes sense to our own work and our own theory of how and our philosophy of how this work should be done or is done at least at YW Boston and then allows us all to, to explain it. I don't know if I did a great job explaining it, but y'all can ask me at, at the end to, to do it again if, if you need. So a logic model is essentially this quote covers that we're talking about the underlying theories and sets of assumptions about 
what the program looks like, how it's going to work, and then whether or not ultimately it succeeds in meeting its goal, right? So a simple logic model will start at the very top with a problem statement. And so this is different than our theory of change because we have each individual program. Um, and within those programs, we have unique ways of approaching how to work within the theory of change. So the problem statement is different for every program that we have. So for example, the Dialogues on Race has a problem statement of, um, if it's in a school that um, not every family in the school feels comfortable and welcome in the same way. And the Dialogues would be an approach to helping all families come to feeling welcome. Then a program goal would be, a very short statement of how you're going to address the problem statement. So if your problem statement is around, for example, I'll do um, eradicating guinea worm because that one's fun and close to being accomplished or hasn't been accomplished. Can I get a nod or a, yeah, I think so. Or so we'll say eradicating guinea worm in Niger. If your program goal is to approach that problem via um, pop-up treatment centers in rural areas, um, then you are not approaching it by um, creating pop-ups in urban areas, for example. So the problem goal will also address what, how you're not, the, the ways that you decide not to address the problem. So we want the program goal to be succinct because we want the goal to be as simple as possible. And again, this is a simple logic model, so I'll talk a little bit about how to introduce complexity in the next few slides. But here's the fun part. So inputs are resources that you dedicate to the program. So uh, any materials, any people, any time, any training that you're putting into the program, you're talking about, um, you're going to put into the, the input section of this uh, theory, I mean this logic model. And then if all those inputs exist and are, are available, then the outputs that come out of it are the actions that your program takes to achieve those, right? So if we have all of the people and we have the participants recruited that we needed and we have all of the materials, including a space to do the program, then we're hoping that a certain number of participants are educated or a certain number of meals are distributed um, or a certain number of students are uh, given literacy tutoring for a certain number of hours. So the, the inputs are a very simple way of describing what the program does. So that's kind of the, the what is being accomplished. Then we move into the outcomes. Um, so the measurable products of a program's activities. Within our programs, since we're doing a lot of education, a lot of that comes from people self-reporting what exactly they learned. So we put in the resources, and then we got people into a room for a certain amount of time to sit together with us and our curriculum and our facilitators. What did they exactly learn? And the outcomes can also be thought of specifically as short-term outcomes. So we ask uh, folks what knowledge that they gained during the course of the program, if their attitude shifted at all, and if they have any goals they have for making a behavior change. We're not going to be able to measure that immediately, right? So we can ask people to set a behavioral goal of uh, getting in 30 minutes of activity every day, for example, in a women's health program, but we're not going to be able to measure that until later. But we can talk about the intention to do some sort of behavior change. And then finally, the impact would be the benefit to the clients, communities, and or systems, right? So yeah, another way to think about impact is long-term outcomes. Of course, within the world of m and and within the world of logic models, there are people that have very different ways of thinking about these things. So I've seen logic models talk about resources, activities, outputs, and outcomes rather than going this way, or some people interchange theory of change and logic model. Um, all I can say is whatever works for you in your program, whatever is actually a useful tool for you, is the way that I think you should structure it. And then my favorite part is within all of the 
within all of the spaces between. So while you're going from inputs to outputs in this little space between, we're making assumptions. Between outputs to outcomes, we're making assumptions. And then we're making big, big assumptions between outcomes and impact, right? So the example that I gave earlier from our women's health program is uh, a, someone intends to uh, work out for 30 minutes every day or get in some kind of physical activity. An assumption that we're making between the outcomes and impact is if the client ultimately does exercise for 30 minutes every day, it's because of our program. So that's kind of an assumption that we're making. We're assuming that if we get people in a room together and educate them, that they're going to ultimately learn something, right? Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end when we go through the Youth Police Dialogues model. But it's really important to recognize the assumptions that you're making and as often as possible being able to test them. So that's one of the reasons evaluation exists. So what you want is just a basic picture of your program. So if someone asks me, um, tell me all about your youth leadership initiative, I can give them our logic model and talk through it for a few minutes and then they would get a sense of exactly what we're doing in the youth leadership program, what we're hoping that the young people get out of it, um, and then what we want the long-term impact of that program to be. It clarifies your strategy also, like I can't, I can't uh, push enough that when you're writing out a sentence about your program and the goals of your program, that it, it really brings into sharp focus if there are things that are strategically incorrect or strategically hazy about your program. Um, and it builds common understanding, especially if you're working with multiple people, multiple stakeholders. Uh, you can give them your, your logic model and talk through the strategy. If there is anything hazy, you can talk through exactly what that means um, and then show exactly what the relationship is between action and results. So then later when you're asking for funding, you can say, you know, this is what we were hoping that the program accomplished in our, through our, log our logic model. We tested these assumptions also, and we can tell you right now that our program is effective at A, B, and C, and we know this because the next step being your evaluation plan. And then, similar to the other things, communicates what your program is and isn't. So, in a simple logic model, hopefully, it can be a series of if-then statements. So, if certain resources are needed to run your program, or certain, reason, certain resources are needed to run your program, excuse me. If you have those resources, then you can do the program itself. If there are any resources missing, you won't be able to do it. Um, that's the if then statement. If you have, if you can accomplish those outputs, then you'll have short come outcome or short term outcomes that you're intending. So we're hoping that when women go through a women's health program, that they have increased knowledge about health and they have um, access to a community to answer their questions. And that's something that we're assuming and we're also testing through our evaluation. And then of course, if we accomplish those services as planned, then there will be long-term impact for our clients, communities, and systems, organizations, et cetera. Cool. Um, so a less simple version of a logic model, for a lot of programs, it doesn't make sense to say if, if A, then B, then C, then D, uh, because that's not the kind of world we live in, right? Um, in, I can tell you in Liberia with the education program that we were working under, there were all sorts of external things coming at us all the time that we had to adjust to, right? If those externalities aren't just random events and things that you try to plan for and account for, then it might be worth working them into your, the logic model itself. So if you run a program and it has a different outcome for um, people of different gender identities, it might be worth having those multiple outcomes listed and uh, clarifying why exactly you have the multiple outcomes. Um, if there are loops that you have to fill, like if you're doing an advocacy project, for example, and you're hoping that the outputs of 
creating uh, a coalition lead to um, that coalition influencing a legislator, for example, there might be a loop where the legislator is influenced in, in one way, but they don't 100% agree with your platform. So then you have to go back to the beginning and you can add all of those things. Whatever is helpful for your program is what you should be writing down and demonstrating through a logic model. And you can also skip it. I, if a logic model isn't working for your program, or if you have a preference for, for example, a log frame, which I know um, a lot of programs that are getting funding from European governments use log frame models of uh, making evaluation plans, then you know a logic model won't make sense. I think there are a lot of resources around the internet and everywhere that makes it feel like you have to do A, B, and C in order to have an effective program. And actually, the most important thing in creating a program strategy and then an evaluation strategy is that it all makes sense for the program. So within the problem statement, just to go back, I'll go through this quickly because we're, we're going through the slides pretty quickly here. Um, understanding the need um, or the problem, the extent of the problem, and also what has happened in the past to address it. Have there been previous iterations of this? Um, have there been previous iterations of your program or a similar program to the one that you're trying to run and it hasn't worked? Then why are we doing it again? The program goal needs to say what your program is going to do and then what success looks like. And I like to think of it also like a vision statement. Um, so some people have a problem with vision statements because they're inherently unmeasurable. Like if, for example, if my vision statement was that I wanted to eliminate racism from Boston, that's pretty difficult to measure, but I like having the vision up on any strategy documents that I'm using because it's nice to have that big, hairy, audacious goal in mind at all times. And then I can also share my PowerPoint at any time. Inputs can include all of these things if you are working with uh, young people after school and you're not feeding them, it's probably a bad idea for your program. It's probably going to make it better if you have some food options. So you really have to think through all of the different things that you need to make your program run. So we already talked about outputs. This is the way that we think about outcomes. And then impact. So do the short-term outcomes have, uh, have lasting effects? Do the effects last to the same degree or do they diminish over time or do they increase over time? Um, and if you keep running your program year after year or day after day, does that have a larger impact? And then you might also want to think about indirect impacts. For example, with our women's health program, if a woman is empowered to make healthy choices about herself, she might also make better and healthy choices, the, the choices that are best for her family, um, for her children, right? So then it's not just the one woman that we educated who is affected by our program, but also her whole family. And then in some cases, it's really important and impactful to think about those things. And then observed impacts where it's appropriate. So if we are in one community and we educate five women and we can see that vaccinations went up 50% after we did our program, that could be a version of an observed impact. And of course, it's, it's tough to tease out causality and all of that, but generally observed impacts um, have a little bit more sway. So then once you have the logic model in place, then you're going to talk about what you did, how well you did it, and how and what exactly it was that you achieved. And what I would do if I were going through a logic model for a new program is probably go back to those outcome and impact statements and really make sure that I was testing all of them. Excuse me, I'm gonna skip that part. So again, this is our, our simple logic model. And so this is the one that I also used for Youth Police Dialogues. So, with a problem statement, I know we only have uh, one person in the room, um, 
I was hoping to get a little bit of a brainstorm around what the problem statement might be around the um, issues between trust between the community of, of police and communities in Boston. Would y'all be willing to, to play along? Let's cool. do it. <laughs> Great. So let's just throw out ideas. What do you think? Um, so I think like with like community in relationship to that, like right now, like we see like a lot of division happening between okay. the police and the community. So like that could be like one of the problems, like how much trust do people actually have in police and doing their job and how much does police need to say like, this is our job, this is what we need to do. Um, and people may not like what they're doing, stuff like that. So that could be a major problem. Cool. So there's a, there's a lack of trust between the community and police. And that's also creating a division between police and the community. Cool. What else? Um, Econ, well, who's logged on is typing into the chat. They said over policing in communities of color, implicit bias, and also lack of trust. Cool. Yeah, exactly. Um, there's a sense of in the communities that the police, there are certain communities in which police are coming by all the time every day. Um, and there's a sense that when you're looking for trouble, trouble you're going to find it, right? And then implicit bias being, um, you know, a, a police officer tending to believe that someone who is a person of color is, is more likely to be the criminal than a white person, for example. Does that make sense? Econ well? Sweet. Cool. Yeah, so totally over-policing. <laughs> that was my first one. Um, there's a disproportionate crime rate between neighborhoods. Um, and there's distrust between community and police officers. Y'all are great at this. Congratulations. Um, that's also called legal cynicism. Um, and we specifically address problems between youth and police officers. So young people are afraid to speak to police officers. Um, there's a certain no snitching culture, and that is probably the result of a fear and distrust of officers. So there's a sense that if, even if a crime is happening, that uh, telling a police officer would be uh, would bring about a worse outcome than not telling anyone at all, right? Officer youth interactions are infrequent outside of conflict situations. So uh, a young person or in some of these communities where over-policing over happens, there's actually not that much interaction with police officers except when there is a conflict. So why would you assume that there are police officers that aren't always yelling or arresting someone or, or questioning people in the neighborhood? And then finally, officers are not trained in youth interactions. So we know from the research that the brains of teenagers are still developing. And uh, I, had, <laughs> I had a psych professor who advised us not to drink until we were 35 because the, the, the brain is still developing and alcohol disrupts that, right? And so we know that for also um, in some of the laws that we have around driving, like teenagers have certain restrictions on when they can drive and how fast and with whom. Um, but officers aren't trained in that generally. In fact, um, I believe in in some communities, the training on how to interact with young people from you know zero to eighteen takes place in less than a day. And that's if we're lucky, there are a lot of uh, areas where none of that training happens. I included this example because we actually don't do that. So Strategies for Youth is an organization in, based in Boston or based in Cambridge, I believe, that is really focused on training police departments and getting in there and talking about what youth brain development looks like and what young people are likely to do when faced with a police officer um, and what, why young people commit petty crimes or violent crimes and, and the differences between adults in those situations and young people in those situations. So when I was saying that a logic model also tells you what you're not doing in your program, that's something that we don't do. But also shout out to Strategies for Youth because they do great work. So our program goals, we address specifically the 
trust issue. So we're trying to bring young people and police officers into a room together uh, to increase trust on both sides. We want young people to trust police officers and vice versa. So we actually could have a complex logic model because we have different outcomes intended for police and different outcomes intended for youth. I stacked it all into one um, logic model that I'll show you in a minute. So like I said, inputs are all of the resources that it takes to make a program run. So for our Youth Police Dialogues program, we have two facilitators, and I should also mention that those facilitators have to be trained. So you could throw in training into this um, logic model as well. We usually want a four to one police officer to youth ratio. Uh, that doesn't always happen, but you know, we can dream. Uh, we want a really great curriculum. We want six weeks of two hour time block. So it requires a total of 12 hours for the young people and the police officers actually are there for 10 of those 12 hours. We need space in order to do the, the program. We need a space that will allow us to get all the people into a room to sit together and really listen to each other. It helps that we don't have, you know, air conditions, conditioners blaring or like a lawnmower outside, like a space that it really uh, allows the young people and police officers to create a connection. And then time to prep police officers before entering the space also. So we do one whole session with young people to prep them for police officers enter the space. Uh, and so we take a little bit of time and also talk to officers about, you know, best practices for being in a space with young people. And that generally actually leads to better outcomes. So our outputs, just simple, like I said, descriptive. It's the number of young people and officers that are going to go through the program. And then the outcomes we want, like I said, are different for young people and police officers, and they're mostly attitude changes. So we don't do programs like, you know, vaccinations or, um, or providing a service, um, you know, besides bringing the people together. Um, we are looking to educate and allow folks to educate each other also and create those spaces. So within the attitude changes for police, we want them to better understand issues facing youth. We want them to better understand issues facing the whole community. And then we want them to be more likely to talk to youth outside of conflict situations. So if they find a group of young people, um, you know, in a train station to go up to them and ask how the day is going or, uh, you know, joke around or find some kind of uh, sports league to work with to find opportunities to show youth that they're not always just there to be a pest, you know, in the eyes of the young people. And for the young people, we want them to feel that police officers care about their safety. And I'm going to show you on the next slide, we have a few quotes from the young people, and it's, it doesn't necessarily have to be universal. We just want them to see one or two examples of officers that disprove their own stereotypes about police officers, which is that police officers don't care about me, and they don't care about my safety. Um, and when they're in my community, it's a bad thing. So even one police officer can do that, right? Because they can see a police officer and then instead of saying, oh, you're a pig like the, like the rest of them say, I actually don't know until, until we interact. We want young people to feel a sense of self-efficacy. So we want them to feel like they can make a difference in their community. So as we're talking through the issues facing the community and they're sitting in a room full of adults and some of the adults are in uniform, we want them to have a sense that their voice really matters and that the, their choices matter a lot too. And then we want young people to be more likely to call a police officer when they see a crime happening. And our, that is actually a very simple question. We just ask um, and on a Likert scale, like when I see a crime happening, I call the police. Before our program, it tends to be lower and after our program, it tends to be higher. So that's an awesome outcome of our program. And we want the ultimate impact to be no difference between crime rates, um, in crime rates between communities. So in Boston, different neighborhoods have different crime rates, and that can be for a variety of reasons. But the way that we approach that issue is actually through this building of trust. Um, and then we want the decrease in crime to happen, of course, and we also want less over-policing. You'll notice that not all of these things are measurable without like experts in geography and experts in um, 
terminology and, and we're building some of those partnerships and it also takes a lot of time and it also takes a lot of resources. But I think if you are running a program for the first time, it's worth starting small, but then having this, these goals to get bigger and bigger as you prove your program's impact. We want lower incidence of street stops with young people. And we want less conflict between young people and police officers. Um, and then finally, oh my goodness, 742. <laughs> so I'll go through the assumptions that we make also about our program and how it works. So, hey Christina. Hey! We're, we're assuming that the attendance is good. So we're assuming that the police officers show up consistently. Um, it looks really bad if to a group of young people, if there's an officer that only comes for one session and then never shows up again. It's just um, fulfilling the stereotypes that police officers don't care about young people and don't care to be in those spaces, right? We're assuming that the facilitation is consistent. So we train facilitators and we want them to be as high quality as possible because if we have a bad facilitator and they you know, let a young person go off for 10 minutes about how much they hate police officers in front of the other officers, that decreases the trust that the officers have as well. You're hoping that the curriculum leads to attitude change. That's something that we test. Um, we're hoping that the attitude change leads to behavior change. And that is something that we're working on, but it's very difficult to test ultimately. So, you know, we can get a survey that, ha that the police officer gives us that says, this has totally changed the way that I approach policing and I'm going to talk to young people as often as possible and, and show them that police officers are here for them. But we don't necessarily know if that carries on past our workshops. We're hoping that the young people don't have negative experiences with police officers after they leave that negate our work. So it's possible that young people will have negative experiences with police officers after they leave. Um, but we're working to test right now whether that erases the work that we do in the youth police dialogues or not. That's not something that we're going to be able to test this year, but um, we've seen in our dialogues whenever there's a media instance of um, an extrajudicial killing by a police officer that our outcomes actually go down. So we're hoping that we can find a way to create some kind of protective factor so that um, even as uh, media coverage of these incidents is going up, that they still find police officers in the community that care about them, uh, and that police officers, of course, in the community are um, reaching out when those things happen. Youth feel safe and open to change, and police feel safe and open to change. There's nothing we can do, no matter how many trainings our facilitators go through, if the trust isn't, uh, if the the space isn't safe enough and there are things that we can do to create that as and scaffold that trust building um, but at the end of the day there are a few young people and a few police officers that are set in their ways so this is the end I, so after you make a logic model and an evaluation plan then at the end of it you're going to have not only proof that your program works but then also awesome quotes that you get to tweet all over the internet and to talk about how much your program rocks and how much money they that people should give you to run it. Um, so you'll notice in the before column, th this is a, actually a project done by young people. They wrote things like, we thought all police were mean as hell and they were bad. Um, I thought in the beginning that police didn't really care about society. Um, and I do not like cops. I hate that they abuse their power. I hate that they can get away with anything. I like the black cops because they get what the people are going through and do not kill white kids. Like this is the before type of, of statements that young people are making about police officers. And in the after they say, now we think they're reasonable and not as bad as we thought. Also, they seem like good people. Still, I think probably not all police are as good as the ones I met, but some must be. And that doesn't seem like a big change, but given the problems that you helped me brainstorm in the beginning um, and the amounts of, of the low amounts of trust between the community and police officers, uh, that's a very big change at the end. So, sorry, I rambled forever. Thank you so much for listening. I hope this was helpful. Uh, definitely get in touch with me on Twitter. I tweet like once a year. 
but I will respond to you if you tweet at me. Um, Definitely follow YW Boston. The work that we do is awesome. And you can see more about Youth Police Dialogues and the other programs that we run. And of course, any questions that you have, feel free to email me later too. So does anyone have any questions for Alvina before uh, we let her go? I know I wrote down a few. Does anyone else have any a question they want to ask? Um, I have a couple questions. Um, well, one first question is, I know I'm coming in a little bit late. I apologize for that. I was on campus doing a meeting and then had to run back here and was like, oh my God, okay, I got to sit on this webinar. Um, first question I have is just to give like a brief overview with, you know, what you've been talking about. If you could just like go back over that in your organization. And also, do you, um, come to college campuses and do you ever talk about this or? Oh, cool. Um, yeah, we, I mean, so we were talking about logic models. And so the reason that I went through this one in particular was because I feel like our Youth Police Dialogues program does have sort of um, a few complicated portions of it. Uh, so if you want the slides later, I can definitely get those back to you. But essentially we're hoping that the program runs the way that this table says that it runs. So if we have these inputs, then these outputs will happen. And then if these outputs happen, then these outcomes will happen. And going on through, and again, going over the assumptions that I made. Um, and yeah, I mean, I talk about evaluation. So I'm like, I'm the most boring person at my organization. I talk about data and like strategy. Um, if you're talking about youth police style, but I'm also happy to, <laughs> to talk at any college campus. Um, if you're talking about the youth police dialogues program in particular, our Youth Police Dialogues Manager is a rock star. Uh, their name is Mika Wharton, and I can definitely get you in touch if you're interested. Okay, great. Um, the reason I ask is because I was just at, um, wasn't the meeting I just came from, but um, I was at an NAACP meeting, um, and also I was asked to come to Black Student Association meeting, and this is the type of information that would be really great for that, you know, type of meeting, and just to know more about it since I kind of came in a little bit late, um, you know, so thank you for, you know, saying that you could send me that information, because I definitely could use that and definitely am interested. Yeah. Awesome, yeah, thank you. Um, I have a question uh, talking about, like, large models, like, large large docs and large models um yeah. back when we were at like the simpler version mm -hmm. uh i was wondering if you have trouble like as an evaluations manager director um what are the hardest things to measure because i know mm -hmm. you have programs about like empowerment and education even it can be really hard to measure your outcomes um because i don't know it just feels like how do you I don't address that, I guess. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that's what they pay me to do. I can't say that I always manage to do so, but I think some of the hardest things to measure are, um, given that our mission is to eliminate racism and empower women, right? <laughs> that's a very difficult thing to measure. Um, and even if we could measure it, there are certain things that we can measure, right? So something like, um, a decrease in crime is one of our impact statements for youth police dialogues. Someone else measures that and we get to uh, take that information. And I wish one day we could say there was a decrease in crime in this neighborhood because of youth police dialogues, for example. But obviously that requires a lot of resources and like a million dollars and a fancy researcher. Um, and our, my salary is much less than that, unfortunately. Um, I think Another difficult thing to measure is some is the uh, the assumptions. Um, especially given long term impact. So it's it's difficult to keep in touch with participants three and six months and 12 months after they've left the program. Um, and especially since our, our programs are usually about six weeks long. Um, participants aren't particularly motivated to keep talking to us and we don't necessarily have the resources to do so. Uh, I'm sort of in the 
the camp that believes that anything could be measured. It just depends on, on, on how accurate those measurements actually end up being given certain circumstances. Does that make sense? Um, awesome. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I also had a question. So do you, I don't know if you, this is like under your job description, but after like what kind of happens after the evaluation component of your pro, like how do you, sorry, <laughs> how do you like implement or do you find that you're able to easily implement like your evaluations into the programs? Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good question. When, when I was working in Liberia, it felt a little bit easier because that the culture of that NGO was sort of a startup culture. So if there was information that said that there was a certain way of doing things that was more effective, then we would immediately go with that. Um, and there was sort of an, an, a loose, not a looseness, I want to say an agility with that model. Uh, to change. And so I think that is a really big component of it. So if we're working on a smaller scale, it's easier to change. If we're working um, with a, a more straightforward project, it's easier to make quick changes and implement those. With our evaluations at YW, it's a little bit harder because we are facing so many different externalities and assumptions. So a lot of we if a program person believes that the issue, for example, is the survey and not, not the program itself, which happens a lot, they'll be like, oh, no, no, I know that this, I know that we're empowering young people. It's just that the survey doesn't quite capture it for this, this, and this reason. I am happy to test that assumption as much as we can, as long as they're also willing to test the assumption that maybe if they change something, that it would make the product the program better and that the outcomes would be better. So I think some of the some of the hesitancy to change based on our outcomes is actually around the it is because there are so many other factors that could go into it. So we're assuming that this outcome is happening because the program needs to change. That's not always true. Um, so when I do get to talk to my program staff and go through all of the different um, scenarios in that case, and we decide that the program changing would be the best way to increase the impact, then it, it's a, a big deal. <laughs> it's a big win. So I, I think that we're not quite as agile at YW, actually, than I have seen at other organizations. But also our work is very complicated, so I can't necessarily say that that's a bad thing. Really, thank you. I I bet there are a lot of like external factors that are involved, just like out of con your control. Yeah. Um. Does anyone else have any questions? Nothing. Um. Do donors? I I'm don't know the answer to this. So I'm asking. Uh. Do Donors generally ask for a lodge. Like, how common is it to ask your, um, like, grantees or people who are asking you for money, how common is it for them to ask for a lodge talk? I think it's way more common in international development programs than international projects, you know, international projects. Um, I think... I think it is helpful for our grants manager. I've, I've received the feedback that it's helpful to see those documents because when they're going through and creating a grant application and they're asking us about our, our essentially our theory of change, but our philosophy around what makes this change happen and what is the best way to tackle this inequity or this issue. Um, I think it comes in, but it comes in through words. So our grants manager turns our logic models into a narrative, essentially. I actually have a question about like donors, because like I was doing some research when like NGOs and stuff like that, 
And how much does like donors influence like what your motive and initiatives are? Because I know like donors like play like a major role. Like if you're not aligning to what the donors want, then then you're they're not gonna, you're not going to get the money that you need. So for like your organization, how does donors like play into your initiatives and your goals? That's a great question. I think our programs are are pretty robust and they are they have historically good outcomes and so it's actually our grants manager is the one who takes it upon herself to really sell our programs to the donors themselves so if there is a donor for example that that wants us to make some sort of change with our program we'll actually work with them to actually normally convince them why our approach is actually the best approach. And a lot of that is around being really clear on what your strategy is from the beginning, which again is one of the reasons that doing a logic model could be helpful for future grant applications. If you have a good program and you know exactly how it works and you can articulate that clearly, then generally donors don't uh, try to interfere or anything like that. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, I have a question, kind of a personal question for you. Um, how, <laughs> not, not that personal. Just how did you find yourself like in evaluations and, um, and even in nonprofit work? Yeah, um, I must have skipped over this in the beginning, but I, I went to college. I wanted to be a psych professor. So I wanted to just do pure research for a living, which is so cool. I, I still appreciate people that do that and approach their work like that. And I, when I was in college, I worked with Jumpstart. I don't know if y'all are familiar, but um, the, the nonprofit that puts college students in uh, preschool classrooms. And I, the woman who taught our, our Jumpstart class, uh, her name is Judy Shikadans, and she is like a huge mind in preschool um, and early childhood learning and development. And so her approach to education was extremely scientific. And I mean, at the same time that it was playful, like you had to play in order to create these incredible literacy outcomes, which was also really fun. Um, but that was the first time that I saw research being applied to policy and being applied directly to you know classroom practice to make an outcome for a young person and as soon as I saw that and because I loved working with the preschoolers and I loved seeing that change and I loved seeing how effective that was that's when I started to make the shift and started to take classes on on brain development with an, a mind towards early childhood education and learning um, specifically so I could see what the connections were so that we could talk about one day, you know, using research to influence policy. So that's why I did public policy research right out of college. Um, and then I found myself in the nonprofit world specifically because I wanted to work a little bit more closely with community projects. So I was working at an organization that did a lot of government contracts and it was just there were huge contracts and, and really big and important projects, but there was so much separation between the people doing the research and the people who were actually affected by the policies themselves. That was not where I wanted to be. I wanted to be a little bit closer to the ground. So that's when I moved into program evaluation. So always a nerd. Once a nerd, always a nerd. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for answering. Yeah, no problem. Um. Does anyone have any other questions? Cool. Great. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, cool. Okay. You don't. If you don't want to stay on, you don't have to. But, <laughs> thanks. Um, thanks. Um, okay. So I think that Beryl, who is supposed to lead the second portion of our webinar, is. Um, having some technical difficulties right now unfortunately uh i'm not sure jessica did she reply to your whatsapp 
Unfortunately, no. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, that's okay. Um, but I would think, but still think it would be cool. Is there any way that Tabu and Jessica could maybe we could just like take like ten minutes or fifteen minutes and share just some updates on your campaigns? I think we'd be able to. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Jessica, um, do you want to start? Yeah, I can start. Okay, right. so basically we're getting in touch with since I go to school and basically um, near Boston and Worcester. So around there they have what is called Pathways for Change and we're working with them to see like what we can do to help because my campaign is basically about ending sexual assaults on college campuses and that's exactly what their mission and initiative is. So we're trying to work out a partnership with them. I'll be meeting them when I get back to campus. I'm getting back to campus on Sunday, so I'll probably see them during the week. Um, so we pretty much like we have the website built it's silence if you want to come check it out because we already have 10 schools that are verified with all their programs that they have toward ending sexual assault and um, what you can do on their campus if you're a student there um, what kind of police stations are near there what kind of hospitals are near yours so we're pretty much like staying in Massachusetts and then branching it out so we're gonna start in Massachusetts and then Hopefully by March, we'll have all of New York schools and Massachusetts schools done. Um, so I have an incredible IT team helping me now at Holy Cross, um, where I go to school, helping me exactly like lay out like where the resources are on campus. So by the March, we should have like over 100 schools on there. So that's our goal. That's our goal. Because I have about like 15 people now helping me. So our team has grown. Our team has grown from six to 15. So I'm very excited about that. And then as well, we also have our Twitter feed that we're always updating. Um, we have our Instagram, our Snapchat, uh, our Facebook, that's always on there. But right now it's our, um, our web I guess our web address that we're really looking towards now and again again my team we are working with partner uh, pathways for change to help that so that's pretty much what we're doing right now and hopefully we'll just keep 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 expanding so awesome that sounds great <laughs> um, cool uh, Tabu do you have updates you want to share I really don't have a lot of updates like I'm, I, I was in school during the holidays, so but I managed to make we managed to uh, start the chicken business, and we're working right now with five women because like we just gathered up the money as with the women and started the very small one, but we are still applying for more funds and everything like that. But for now, we just I keep on trying to apply for funds and everything. But we're still working on it. That's the only thing I have. <laughs> yeah, that's like the biggest thing right now is trying to like apply for grants and funds because we're so new. So like that's where like that's where like the roadblock even I'm hitting right now as well. So yeah, but we'll see. Yeah, that's tricky. Um, do you feel like that's a barrier at all to like what you're able to do like yeah uh, i think it's it's a very big barrier in that like we i had planned to work with 15 women and we had planned to start with i think 50 chicken but right now we only have about 10 but Anyway, we started. Yeah, <laughs> we started with the, this uh, the same ten chickens, but I think it's. I don't know. I don't think if I don't get any grants, I'm going to achieve what I planned. But we are moving there. Um. Awesome. Thanks, guys, for sharing your uh, updates. Does anyone else have anything they wanna? say before we I guess we'll end early today I think Beryl will probably go um share her campaign and uh what she wanted to talk about at a later time um but she was planning on talking about uh, myths in sex education so it sounded really interesting um let's see okay I don't is there any anyone have any final comments <laughs> okay. Cool. Um, to 
Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, go for it. <laughs> to um, reiterate, um, so that, that's silencethesound.net and for Sabu, I think I pronounced your name right. I'm sorry if I didn't. Um, you said that you have at least five ladies who you're working with thus far. Um, is there anything that I can search for online to look at it more? Um, or anything like, um, what am I trying to say, digital that I could actually look at or, you know, suggestions to add? Like a Facebook page or like yes. a Twitter? You Twitter, you know, dialogue. Uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's a Facebook page and then uh, child marriages and prostitution through entrepreneurship, but I haven't uploaded pictures of the women working yet. I I'll have to do it maybe by the course of this week. Like I have exams and when I'm done. It's ending child marriages and prostitution, right? That's the name of the Facebook yep. page. Okay, so that's the Facebook page if you want to follow Tabu's campaign. Um, Jessica, do you have any social media you want to share? Yeah, it's just like, it's just silence to sound campaign, like on Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, and Twitter. Yeah, it's all the same. Awesome. All right, cool. Does anyone have any final comments to share? The next webinar will be February 21st at 10, I think that's the Tuesday, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, it's the same link, and the Bernard Brothers from the Oceans campaign should be uh, leading um, the second half of the webinar. Uh, awesome. Thank you guys for joining. Um, I'll see you all later. <laughs> Bye. All right.